Hello, my name is Naranjan, the host of Master of Your Crafts podcast. Learning from leaders who are continuously inspired, passionate, and driven to align with their soul purpose, sharing their gifts to bring healing to others. The music is composed by Rebecca Everett. talking to David Farrell. David is a plant shaman who comes from an Irish Cornish background and his Celtic roots form a strong part of his healing and shamanic practices. He is a trained plant spirit healer, crystal healer, geomancer and you mysteries initiate. He has also been initiated in a long lineage of Quechua Tabacuaris from the Ecuadorian Amazon rainforest. He spent three years in India and Italy studying Tibetan Buddhism deeply in a semi-monastic center and has taken teachings and empowerment from H.H. Dalai Lama and Dagri Rinpoche, as well as other Lamas and Rinpoches. He brings all of those different modalities into his teaching and healing and works a lot with his ancient ancestors in the land. He co-founded the groundbreaking event, Gateway of the Mind, Plant Consciousness, and the Shamanic Land, as well as co-founding the online TV platform, Wisdom Hub TV, where he is the lead interviewer and curator. Now residing in Mexico, he offers quantum remote healing and occasionally runs plant medicine retreats working with various sacred plants, cactus and fungi. Hello and welcome to David. How are you today? I'm doing great, Naranjan. Thank you for having me on your podcast today. I'm excited to have this juicy conversation with you about plant medicine and everything that it encompasses and the journey it's led you on and the other people who have come on your path. So what do you believe about yourself in the context of plant medicine? I know I saw those eyebrows rise. And does it define who you are? Wow, we've got in with some big questions straight off the bat. I know, no time to absolutely. ease myself in at the crease, as a cricketer would say. It's a fastball straight from the off. Um, yeah, okay. So, mm, I mean, in this moment that we're in, uh, energetically speaking, um, astrologically speaking, timeline speaking, <clears throat> I guess for me, I'm in a moment where I'm really letting go of everything about myself, including who or what I think I am. And I really believe that the astrology is showing us right now that this is a time for us all to let go of the past and these fabrications or edifices or structures that we have created around ourselves to protect ourselves, to give ourselves an identity, to navigate the world. I really feel that the astrology is showing us that we can let those go now and step into a different way of being. And that's really the journey that I've been on for a while. I mean, I've been on the inner healing journey since 2010, which is interesting if, uh, if you're into the astrology, because we're just coming up to the end of the cycle, uh, which started in 2010. For me, uh, that started in Egypt on a 10-day spiritual trip, uh, which culminated in a six-hour meditation in the King's Chamber in the Great Pyramid, uh, completely to ourselves. We had the whole place to ourselves for six hours, an incredible experience on the spring equinox of 2010, but that whole trip really ended up being uh, the beginning of a journey, um, really initiated by Sekhmet. And for those of you who know anything about Egyptology, she, she is one of the great initiators. And that started a journey uh, that then led myself and my ex-wife on a journey all over the world uh, to, to Italy, to spend two years in a Buddhist monastery there, to India, to Ecuador to spend six months in the jungle, learning with the plant shaman, to be initiated into a tobacco lineage, uh, and then onto many other things too, you know, including all of the work that I've learned with people like Pam Montgomery and Carol Guyer, who've been a lot of my plant teachers. I've had some amazing teachers over the years, both human and plant. 
But I would say that, you know, uh, for anyone who ever gets to sit in a sacred medicine circle with me, some people have said I look like a cactus <laughs> sometimes when they see me in the astral space. And I think maybe that might just be down to how much uh, San Pedro I've consumed in my life because it's been a lot. So I don't know, maybe I'm part cactus, part plant. I, you know, I love the plants. Um, they they've really changed me they've changed my life they've changed my perspective on how i view my interaction with mother earth uh and you know what's really excited me is the work that i do at a quantum level with the conscious intelligence of plants you know um i being a, somewhat of a buddhist student um really believe that many of the medicine plants are what we might call bodhisattvas beings that have returned uh, because they are very realized, maybe enlightened, maybe not, I don't know. But certainly the intelligence of many plants I've encountered is incredibly, uh, I don't know, I, I wouldn't say necessarily superior to that of our own, but I would say that it's of a very high level. And if you think about how even a plant like mugwort or nettle or dandelion manifests in our world, it, it's there and it gives and it doesn't expect anything back in return. Sure, if we take a medicine or make an essence or something, we like to make the exchange and we give some tobacco or a gift or something. But ultimately, the plant will be there and it will give its medicine regardless of whether we do that or not. And to me, that's just an amazing gift. You know, you think about the medicine that some of these plants have and the intelligence behind that. And once you start to communicate with, we can call them spirits maybe, but I think conscious intelligence is perhaps a slightly more modern way of understanding it. In the same way that my higher mind is quantum intelligence, plants are the same. I just happen to manifest into a human meat bag and they manifest, and a bit like a Buddha, right? They manifest ubiquitously often all around the planet at once. What kind of being can spread its consciousness to 100,000, 100 million plants all at once and have all of its medicine in all of those plants, right? I can't do that. There isn't 100,000 Davids wandering around the world, thankfully, uh, you know, but there's certainly a lot of dandelions in the world. And, you know, and that's a medicine that I'd like to talk a little bit about today, because I think it's really, really important right now for many reasons. But once we start to engage with these plants at this kind of quantum level, we understand how the more physical herbal aspects manifest. But we also learn many other things about the metaphysical nature of these plants and the beings that really inhabit the, the, the manifest 3D plant that we see in the ground. So that's kind of a long way of saying, you know, to come back to your original point, that um, these days I don't really see myself as much at all. Maybe I might call myself a plant shaman. I might call myself a healer. I might call myself a curandero. I might call myself a wizard. I might not call myself anything at all. Uh, you know, most days being David is a full on job. Um, so I prefer not to put myself into boxes, but essentially, yes, I'm a healer. I'm a plant shaman and I work with the quantum intelligence of plants, primarily, not exclusively. I work with other beings to, to heal. I would say even maybe not even heal, but clear. My speciality is clearing unhelpful energies from the human energy field, which normally comes in the, the traditional forms of blockages, entities, attachments, etc. Um, but as as you know, maybe some of your audience might know, I'm, I'm, you know, anyone who knows me, I'm four planets in Scorpio. So delving into those never regions of the underworld is, even if I didn't want to do it, the spirit decided I was going to do it anyway. So, you know, but that's been a journey for me. If I think back to five or six years ago, before I went to the Amazon, I was petrified of my own stuff. And it came for me every single time I drank ayahuasca. It came for me every single time I took mushroom tea. And in the end, that was a defining turning point for me because I'm just, I can't keep drinking medicine, basically wondering if I'm going to get roughed up by my stuff. And so that's when uh, spirits kind of stepped in and said, okay, we're going to uh, take you to the Amazon. And that was a long journey, six months uh, down there, which was really a baptism of fire into the nature of pure Amazonian shamanism, which mostly was dealing with the dark arts but also getting rid of the fear, not being afraid of my own stuff, not being afraid of other people's stuff. And then progressively over the last seven years, just getting better at dealing with that, understanding the frequencies, that different types of beings will emanate when they're in clients' fields. And so for me, as uh, my, my friend and uh, erudite astrologer, Pam Gregory would talk about, she says that everything is frequency and we're in a time when the frequency differentiations are becoming much more obvious. And so for me, I think a lot of the work that I do, it being a very, very sensitive empath, is really just about understanding what is the frequency I'm encountering. Is it a frequency that makes me feel a certain way, like yucky and ugh, heavy, or is it a frequency that makes me feel expanded and uplifted? 
And in the end, I kind of think that it's helpful to see everything as a frequency. It removes that kind of good, bad, light, dark, polarity, duality that we're living in, in which I really feel we were being encouraged to step outside of now and to take that eagle's perch, the fifth dimensional consciousness perspective on things. Because when we can sit at that eagle's perch, the ascended part of the Scorpio persona, so to speak, we can see the illusion that is gripping the world right now for what it really is. And we can see that it's an illusion and that it's an illusion that from a fifth dimensional perspective can't hurt us and doesn't really exist. And yet somehow we still have to navigate our way through this heavy 3D soup, you know? So I feel that this is the journey that we're all in right now. And many people are in different places. And, you know, again, I think that we have been divided very, very effectively by so many things over the last couple of years. And that's a very, very clever way of stopping us from really dreaming in what I think is something that's already here, which is what many of us are calling New Earth, which is a different way of being, a different frequency, very much more connected to higher mind, very Aquarian. But in order to be stable and comfortable in that space, we need to be clean and clear. And if we're constantly absorbing pollutants from mainstream media, from family, from friends, whatever way we understand that with whatever dynamics going on in our world, then that's creating denser, heavier frequencies in our field that stop us expanding into those higher places. Hopefully that in some way answers your initial questions. Yeah, there was a lot in there. But having said that, thank you so much, because that was a big loaded question that I threw at you too. So <laughs> thank you for that. All of the journeys and everything that you have garnered right now and the wisdom of where you're at, what was that tipping point for you? of, I need to look at something else. This isn't working. Good question. So I'd say there was two or three points, really. The first was in 2010 uh, on that trip to Egypt. Uh, we had just left Dubai at that point after nine years in a very uh, superficial, uh, commercial, uh, capitalist environment, albeit a very strong uh, Muslim environment. And uh, I had a great job uh, for those people who don't know my previous life in this life was as an exhibition director working in the traffic and transport industry, uh, a million miles away really from what I'm doing now. Uh, and that, that uh, work really actually now I look back on it was useful because it taught me how to hold space for thousands of people, including dignitaries and sheikhs. And as the exhibition director, I had thousands of people under my care. Uh, for three days, you know, um, whilst the exhibition was on. And so I learned how to hold space in that way. And at the time, I didn't really understand that. But now I look back and I did that for nearly a decade. Uh, I realised, you know, how many different types of people I got to meet. You know, like I said, sheikhs, uh, Middle Eastern government ministers, Arab businessmen, Indian businessmen, Asian businessmen, European distributors, you know, and having to wear different faces to all of those people in, and in order to understand what did they need from me and what did they need from my exhibition. And so I look back now and I'm really, really grateful actually for a lot of that experience because it really got me to be pretty adaptable to dealing with different people, different types of mindsets, different cultures. And uh, I actually really enjoyed that. I'm kind of funny really, because I love being around people, but I also being empathic find it quite difficult sometimes to be around people too long. So I kind of have this slight push pull energy but after after all of the the years in Dubai doing that then we went to Egypt and um, we decided actually prior to going to Egypt that we were going to leave Dubai and move to India so we left Dubai went on a holiday to Egypt had this incredible wake-up experience and then moved straight to India and um, we carried on doing our work there for a wee while uh, running our stuff from from India in Dubai and then then we had an epiphany one day and it was just like, you know what, man, I'm just not into this anymore. We ran our last event and, and it went reasonably well and we had enough money to, to basically take some time off. And so we said, you know what, man, let's just turn our back on this. It was a very successful business. And we said, you know what, I, I, I want to embrace something different. And actually what really happened was around that time, I had a very, very powerful kind of, I guess, intuition that there was no time to waste that really, uh, if I needed to get myself into the shape that I needed to be in, in the moment that I'm now in, I had to engage in the inner work immediately and it was going to be long and it was going to be relentless. And that really is what turned out to be the next 12 years. So I'd say that was the first point. And then I would say the second real major point was when I first drank ayahuasca in 2012. And she was the one who really told me to organise plant consciousness. Um, which then became uh, the sort of the groundbreaking event in Europe that it was for five years, really bringing together all kinds of people to 
uh, examine the conscious intelligence of plants from, from lots of perspectives, from plant spirit healing to infiogens to permaculture to biomimicry to, you know, many, many different things to, to pure herbalism and just exploring that space that plants inhabit and really trying to get people to reframe how they viewed plants. You know, we suffer from something called plant blindness really in the West, which is that we don't see plants. We just see the things that humans make. And that's been proven now in various uh, studies. And so a lot of the whole point of plant consciousness was really to wake people up to the possibilities of co-creation and healing that the plant kingdom, queendom and the tree world and the fungi world can offer us when we open our hearts and open our minds and understand that we, we live in this incredible biosphere that is Mother Earth and that we are part of nature. And I think that that always a big part of plant consciousness was trying to show how separated we've become from our natural environment. And I think it's not too difficult to see where that's led us, right? You know, this separation from our natural selves has led us into this big mess that we're now in, which I also believe is an incredibly spiritual process. You know, this is, again, is the, the benefit of having a non-dual view of things is you always, always see the light working through the dark and then you realize the light and dark work hand in hand and that everything is perfect. That's right. Um, I know it's easy for me to say that now, Sarah, in Mexico with my wonderful view, but man, the journey to get here has nearly killed me several times. So, uh, you know, I kind of feel like I can say that. But, you know, I understand that many people in the world right now are facing immense difficulties, feeling stuck and feeling like there's no route out. And I would say that there is always a choice. Um, but the choices are not always easy ones or, you know, you might feel like you've got two choices, but both of them are bad. Right. Hey, you know, and not all choices are always great, but if you make the right one based on your intuition and your heart, you will find that um, that it will lead you to a better place and something that makes more sense. Um, but sometimes it takes a wee while. Yeah. It takes courage though, right? Yeah. Courage and bravery, I think, are a big part of the spiritual warrior's path. And I would suggest that all of us right now are on our own hero's journeys uh, and, you know, it's a conversation I've been having a lot recently, you know, it's about, um, we've been kind of programmed with this idea of being selfish. And what I'm really seeing is that sometimes we have to put ourselves as the individual first, because if we're not doing that, then we're not really helping anybody. If we're not helping ourselves, how can we truly help anybody? And of course I can say that uh, not being a parent and so I don't have children to look after. So I understand there are some dynamics there, but I do really believe that in order to be sovereign, which is what the new earth, the new paradigm, the new frequencies are asking of us, we really have to examine everywhere in our life that we have an attachment or a codependency, either with a person or the state or the system or our bank balance or the internet. It's just like, Mm -mm, the new earth is not going to allow any of that stuff, man. So get used to giving stuff up and letting stuff go. Because when you do, you suddenly find that you A, release a lot of stress, B, release a lot of heavy burdens on your back and C, you suddenly discover that you can be free. Mm -hmm. And I have to say, having just recently kind of gone through this process, to be free is actually quite scary because in the West, we're not used to being free. We think we're free, but we're not free at all. To okay. actually step out and be free of, of mummy and daddy, the state, yeah, we all say we want to do it, but when we do it, suddenly the anchors and roots that we thought we had into the normal world have gone and we're suddenly having to survive on our own. Yeah. And that's what it means to be sovereign and it makes you resourceful and it makes you see the world in a different way. But in the same token, as we might be fearful of what freedom really looks like, our perception or our definition of not having this system around us in itself has installed fear. So the definition of this system has perpetuated fear from the onset. Yeah, I would agree. And I think that, you know, um, we're at a time when people are really struggling to know who or what to trust. And I would suggest that's also part of this process. In the end, the only thing that you should really ever really trust 100% is yourself. And then hopefully you have people around you you can trust too. But if you can't trust yourself in every moment, then who can you trust? And I think that a lot of what we're seeing on the television right now is really testing that 
how much illusion are we prepared to swallow? Uh, how much do we really want to buy into somebody else's narratives? Because people buy into the narratives of mainstream media and government all the time and don't question any of it. And then they repeat it as verbatim as something they've seen themselves. And I'm just like, well, you know what? I can't be sure of anything unless I was there. And even if I was there with somebody else, we both might have viewed the same thing differently. So how can we be sure of what is the truth? And so I think that we're at a time when the truth is very flexible, but the truth is also very expansive. And what was true for me yesterday might not be true for me today. And that's OK. Uh, and we should be able to be free enough to, to adjust our truths. But I would really suggest that, yes, the, the programming of fear in our society is quite deep. And all certain systems have to do is run a bunch of narratives and everybody has swapped one narrative of fear for another one. And, you know, I don't need to go into exactly what I'm talking about, but anyone who's watching the news recently will have some idea. And I would suggest that all of this is all a distraction. All of it's the illusion. doesn't matter who's invading who or who did what to who. It's all in the pantomime. It's all part of the performance. And the trick really is to step back from that and go, I don't want to be involved in the performance. I'm happy to watch it for the incredible piece of theatre that it is. And there are lots of pantomime villains. You know, there's plenty of those in, in the mix. Yeah. Uh, and just observe it and just observe people for what it is and say, that's great, but hey, you know what, man, I'm gonna go over here and do something completely different that doesn't require your permission, doesn't require me to be a part of your state, doesn't yeah. require me to be a part of your system. And I'm going to embrace that new frequency of freedom and expansion. And I think that that is something that is really on offer to everybody, but you have to want it. Spirit isn't just gonna give it up like and deliver it into your hand. You have to show spirit that you want it and you have to be clear in your intentions for yourself right. and maybe your children. Right. So, yeah. The environment that we're in, when there's an element of uncertainty, creates an element of fear, and I know you've addressed that. But when we reflect, because we know for sure when there's a 2020 perspective, no pun intended about all happening on 2020, but when we can look in the rear view mirror of what had happened, not, I'm not talking about the world events of the pandemic, I'm talking about even before that. Let's go back to the time when life was quote unquote normal. And let's look at those chain of events that actually happened then. Can we sit and have an objective look at what was happening in the world before those lessons and messages got so loud where the entire world came to a halt? So... Yes, this might be amplified because of the scale. And that might be a really big pill for people to swallow. But let's go before that, which might make it a little bit easier for people to say, okay, I can see that. I can see when SARS broke out or when AIDS broke out, or I could see that. All these 9-11 and world events that took place, can I connect those dots? And do they all lead to the same road to where we are today? In somebody's mind, as they review and reflect on that, they may, they may not. But that's all part of the process of unraveling your own truth, not to peg it's a good guy or a bad guy, but to define what what you, your investigation process is. Because ultimately, as you have shared, it's all about that process. It's the journey in between. It's not I want to get from A to, A to Z like that. Isn't that what life is? Mm -hmm. I couldn't agree more, Naranjan. You know, um, so many things just to reflect on there and what you said. So... I'd like to deal with the uncertainty first. Humans have this incredible ability to be afraid of the future because we need to feel that it's going to be secure and that we're going to be safe. And I get that, you know, uh, but we've also been programmed with that and we've been brought up to believe that. That's why we have insurance schemes, right? So that when things go wrong, you get your money back, right? That to me is already a fear-based exercise. It tells me that you believe that it's going to go wrong. So you're calling that energy in. I'm not a big fan of insurance. I really avoid it at all costs because I, in my world, I, I'm going to be fine. Why, why do I need insurance? That's If I go into that place, I'm going to fear that maybe I'm not going to be okay. And even if I'm not okay, there's a reason for it. Now that's a journey to get to that place. That's a journey of trust and it's a journey of letting go and it's a journey of faith. 
and it takes time. It's certainly taken me a few years to really let go into a place of going, I don't want to know what's going to happen in the future. I don't need to know that I'm going to be okay because I already trust that I am because my life is, has been proven over and over again that in the moment when something bad happens, immediately afterwards or very soon afterwards something good happens you know if we're using those terms and i prefer not to because there's there just right. is but yeah, yeah, yeah you know what i'm talking about mm -hmm. and so i understand that letting go of the system is letting go of those anchor points and giving a great deal of uncertainty however what i found is that when i uh, went through that process i started to really work with a lot uh, with, with intentions but very open intention which is please allow the most appropriate people to come into my life Please allow the most appropriate clients to come to my healing who will get the most from it. Please allow everything to be the most appropriate way. What that really started to do for me was remove the stress. Because if it's the most appropriate thing that's going to happen, then it was the most appropriate thing, no matter how it turns out. And what that's really enabled me to do is when I've been in more challenging moments and over the last 12, 15 months has been a lot, it's allowed me to have the space to go, you know what, this is just a temporary situation. I'm experiencing this right now because I need to, probably because I need to release something, I need to heal something. And then those really challenging moments become joyous moments of liberation and realization. Right. So then there are no bad moments, right? So I have nothing right. to worry about. And so, but you know, I understand it's a journey and it's definitely taken me a long, long while to get there. And, and the last couple of years has really been the final pieces of letting go. Yeah. So that's the uncertainty aspect. But yeah, you know, if you study the astrology, if you study history at all, you can go back 200 years into the Industrial Revolution and see that this is a process that was done to us before. You can go back another 200 years mm -hmm. before that. And those of you understand about the elemental switches every 200 years of the astrology, you go back 200 years into the Earth energy, we have the Industrial Revolution. You go back 200 years before that, and we have the British, Spanish and French navies ruling the seas. You go back 200 years before that into fire what do you get you get the invention of gunpowder so you can see that throughout the ages that somebody or some people have been engineering and guiding the trajectory of humans to suit their own ends particularly i think in the age of the industrial revolution and the victorian era that's very very clear and for those people who are into rabbit holes or conspiracy theories there's a very interesting series of books called the invisible college that show how that was done and how certain groups of beings on the planet plan 200 years in advance so you get to a place where you start to realize that every long time ago by a bunch of very very clever beings whoever they might be and actually that's the whole point that's the illusion that's the matrix that's the labyrinth that we have to navigate our way out of so on the one hand it's dark it's sinister it's odious it's got all of these horrible characters that we love to hate the pantomime villains and i'm sure we can all think of a few of those but ultimately Really what the matrix gives us is this opportunity to escape the labyrinth and realize that we uh, are the generators of our own, rea own reality. We don't need to um, absorb or uh, accept somebody else's. We can create our own realities. And I really believe now with the energies that are on the planet and the astrology, particularly with the Piscean theme at the moment, this is a time of dreams. This is a time where we can really engage in that Piscean dream energy of the collective and actually dream in something that does not need all of the oppressive energies that we've had over the last few hundred years. And that's a choice. But what's interesting is that humans will often choose that choice because they don't know that they can choose something else. And I feel like this is a time to be brave really to be brave and say you know what i choose something different i choose to step into the abyss i choose to step into the unknown and embrace it and be excited about it and not be afraid of uh you know if it goes wrong will i get an insurance payout at the end of the year you know it's not about that it's not even about money i think it's about something completely different a hundred percent i totally agree with you on that the another perspective that i'd like to emphasize that you've kind of talked about a little bit is the element of power, right? Mm. As, as human beings who we are, we're pretty powerful. So I keep bringing back to the conversation to pre-pandemic because I hear over and over again, I just want things to get back to normal. I want to be able to go to a restaurant. I want to be able to travel. I hear that. But in the same token, let's go back to pre-pandemic and recognize how much power you had as a person. The power of your own choice, the power of your own thought. How much of that have you really surrendered? Or actually maybe surrender is not the right word. How much of it have you given up? 
I think it's a really important point there, Angie. You know, um, some of us were told by our elders maybe five or six years ago that spring 2020 was going to be the moment that the world would start to change and that we better start preparing for that. So we did. Um, some of us uh, made sure that when the virus or whatever hit, that we were in a, in a place of having everything that we needed. So for me, barely did that reality exist the last two years. You know, so I, I think on one level, because it was so strong, my energy field, I'm not buying into this. It's not my reality. It never became my reality. I never really wore a mask anywhere. I never got accosted by anybody. I had my government exemption badge, so I was still obeying the rules, so to speak. But what I really observed was that within the whole pandemic, picture there were lots of get out clauses which if you were smart and paying attention told you that the whole thing really was an illusion because they were giving you very you know it's mandatory to wear a mask except if you're exempt and how do you become exempt well you go on the government website and print off their exemption badge mm. anyone can do that mm. So, you know, when you know that that's in the mix, you start to question a lot of things. And a bunch of us realised that straight from the beginning. And so we had our exemption badges. You know what actually happened? Having the exemption badge in my wallet, I never, ever got asked in any shop to wear my mask. And, on, uh, and you know, and on, I think towards the end, when I moved out of Wales, because I was in Wales and I had to, to be in England, I did get asked a couple of times. And every time I went to say, hey, do you need to see my exemption badge? Nobody wanted to look at it. They literally would turn away. And I thought that's really interesting. It's almost as if some part of their subconscious doesn't want to understand that there was another option here. Yeah. There was another reality that I could have lived in for the last two years. It didn't involve having to all those, you know, all those restrictions. And by the way, the government gave me that option. So yeah. we talk about power, right? Yeah. And I share that story because I took back my power. I never gave up my power. I never yeah. succumbed to the rhetoric, to the narratives. I'm like, no, that's not my reality. But I totally agree with you that we can go back pre-pandemic. And I believe uh, in my conversations with the angelic realms that I work with, and I've been asking for the better part of two decades, when, when is the world going to change? When is humanity going to wake up? When are, when are they going to change? And the same answer came back. It's like, brother, we've given you so many chances to change. And in the end, we've had to bring down because this, this is also the light working in this pandemic. You know, they're giving everybody the opportunity to get rid of the distractions, the restaurant, the pub, the holidays, even those partners maybe we've been living with for some time that suddenly we realize we actually don't like that much. Right. Or those yeah. family members that we really have to hang out with at Christmas. So really, we don't like that much either. And just mm -hmm. because we're related. And so all of these things, I think, have come under the spotlight to show us mm -hmm. where we're giving away our power to the illusion, to the distraction. Yeah, you know, I like to go out to, to a nice restaurant, eat nice food. I like to go to the cinema. I used to like to go and watch football, but I knew come spring 2020, all of that was over. And I knew that probably, I mean, I ended up flying to Mexico, which was a surprise. It wasn't something I planned. But I'd also, along with many of my friends, given up the possibility of ever flying again. Certainly, I, I don't envisage holidays. I'm like, what kind of holiday can you have right now anyway? what kind? Mm. I don't know. Maybe some people out there are having great holidays, but for me to sit in, in that it's just surreal, yeah. you know, so I totally yeah. concur with you that we've been giving away, giving away our power for a long time. And I really, uh, in this moment in 2022, I really thank the pandemic, pandemic, COVID, COVID, however you want to call it, experience right. for everything that it's shown yeah. me, everything that it's taken away from me, everything that it's shown me that I was attached to. Mm -hmm. So, yes, on the one hand, it's deeply dark, sinister, insidious and all of that stuff because it is, because it's duality. Yes. But on the other yes. hand, it's incredibly freeing, expansive, releasing, liberating. Yes. Again, the choice. How do you see it? That's right. I know we're edging towards the end of our conversation, so I'm going to open it up to you. In mm. that place of being in a place of power, but also what are maybe one or two things for somebody who feels like they've given up their power can do to take it back, not in an overwhelming way, but in an empowered way that it's manageable for them. So they can work with it rather than I've got this massive elephant in my room. I don't know how to manage this. Wow, yeah, good question. And one that I get asked a fair bit these days. I mean, for me, I will pretty much always revert back to plants to start with because that's what I know and that's what's helped me. So I would suggest that one of the major issues that Western humans have had over the last, I don't know, handful of decades is boundaries. Humans find boundaries difficult. 
We don't know when to say no. We don't know when to hold our boundaries. We don't know, you know, and, and particularly being an empath, I struggled with this for many years. Being firm on my boundaries often felt like it was offending somebody. And because I would feel their emotions of feeling upset, I would then think they were upset with me. And actually that wasn't the case. And it's taken me a long time to work that out. And I suggest probably there's a lot of empathic people out there that might have similar experiences and really having to learn, you know what, that's my boundary. And if I say no, it's for my own benefit. I don't mean to be mean or rude and I'm not any of those things, but I have to do what's right for me and what's good for me. And so many of us healers have been giving ourselves away for so long because we want to help other people. I'm sure you would understand that too, Naranjan, mm -hmm. as yeah. many of your listeners. And, and, and that's not a bad thing, but ultimately, A, we're losing power. B, we're not being strong on our boundaries. And C, we don't know when to say no. And sometimes people will keep taking and taking and taking, and we don't know when to stop that. So I would suggest that a good place to start is getting firm on boundaries. And the plant that I really suggest that is great for this is nettle. Nettle is an amazing plant to meditate with. Uh, Milarepa, the famous Tibetan ascended master, spent 20 years sitting in a cave drinking only nettle juice and he became enlightened. And his, his skin turned green and his hair turned green, which I think is kind of cool, like, you know, oh, wow. uh, being a plant person. But, um, you know, nettle is, is one of the best plants for deep, deep meditations with, but it's also a plant. If you watch it in the, in the natural environment, you like, for example, in Britain, you'll see nettle uh, circling a hawthorn tree, like rows of Roman soldiers. There's a very kind of strong warrior aspect to nettle, mm. which gives us that fire and that strength to say, you know what? Hey, that doesn't work for me right now. Uh, you, you know, you go ahead and do it, brother, sister, whatever. But I, 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 that doesn't work for me. So I'm just going to say no. I'm going to drop out and be strong enough to say, hey, you know, I'm going to go and do something else. Nothing personal. So that's a little little thing, you know, an easy yeah. plant to work with either as an essence or, you know, nettle tea is also great right now because it's a cleansing plant. So that's one place to start. But I would really also suggest that uh, a good meditation right now is to sit and think clearly about where are you giving your power away to other people and to the state. And sometimes it's in places you don't expect. I mean, Internet, for example, right, is one. Bank balance is another, another one. You know, uh, mortgage. You're giving your power away to the bank through your mortgage because they could foreclose on you at any point. And so that's permanently there until you pay it off. So, you know, this is, these are situations that most people have in their lives. I, I thankfully don't, but those were conscious choices that I made throughout my life not to have those things because I could see the energetic burden that it would bring. And I didn't want to bring that on myself. I had plenty of other burdens to worry about. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I would suggest this is a time to really sit and be calm and clear, do a nettle meditation and ask yourself, where am I giving my power away? What is stopping me right now from stepping into the future that I really want for myself? And this is a question I put to a lot of people. Right. Maybe you do the same thing. It's like, if you removed all of the blockages and obstacles that you perceive to your happiness and just had a blank piece of paper and you could draw what your life would look like, what would it look like? What would you put on there? Mm -hmm. And actually, when I ask that question to other people, they don't know. I'm like, mm -hmm. right, that's, that's why you're confused about your life right now, because you don't know what you want, because you're so busy yeah. making decisions that are based on a blockage in your life. You're trying to find a way around that rather than going, actually, what I really want to do is something completely different over here. I, I don't want to even do that. So why am I trying to find a solution to something I don't want to do, wasting all of that creative energy when I could be going, hey, but well, what I really want to do is sit in the garden, plant wormwood and talk to plants which is yeah. what I want to do most of the day. And that's great because I'm making medicine that can help people who are suffering from shedding because wormwood is an anti-parasitic plant. It's incredibly mm -hmm. powerful, incredibly useful right now. Mm -hmm. And I'm just like, wow, you know, is that okay, Spirit, for me to sit and, and make medicine all day and provide it for people? Absolutely, brother. We need yeah. medicine. Okay, great. So, you know, life can be simple, you know, and I think that that's right. what I was suggesting, Ranjan, is really reduce it back to what makes your heart open and sing, and what's in your head that makes you think that that's something you want? Because it's not always mm -hmm. the same thing. And society gives us the stuff here. But what's in here in our heart is what's in our heart. And that's something for us only. And only we can open that box and let it flow out and then see what's in it. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I love that, that you brought it back to the heart. Because this thing between the ears, it can take us, can take us down a path that is not fulfilling where the heart is constantly yearning and needing and looking for um, a resonance of fulfillment. Mm -hmm. So while you share that piece of to reflect on what is it they want to fill from that blank piece of paper, my addition to that would be what would it feel like? 
And you might not even know what it feels like because that is like asking somebody, what do you want when they don't know what they want? Right. Just stepping into a place of imagining what it could possibly feel like Mm. and then embodying that emotion, Mm -hmm. I think would be really powerful for people to do because... It all starts with vibration and frequency in my rule, in my place. And I know that's the language you, you, you was using and Pam uses, but yeah, vibration, frequency, we're all energy. Right. And what a gift. What a gift. Yeah, I, I would totally agree. And, and I think for me, that that's the thing that's got me through life is, you know, I, I feel everything. I, I'm not always necessarily the most visionary person compared to many people, although I do often receive visions from the plants. But what I really receive is an energetic feeling in my mm-hmm. field that tells me a lot of information. Then that manifests often as a vision or a representation. Right. But first of all, it's a feeling in my body. And that's how I make decisions. Does this feel like something I want to do? No, I'm feeling kind of heavy and down about it. OK, don't do it. Am I feeling light and excited and happy? Yes. Then that's what you want to do. And I right. think that we've been so disconnected with this thing between our ears and the programming and the mainstream media and heavy metals and all the rest of it, that we don't know what it's like to trust our own intuition anymore, to trust the feeling. And, you know, personally speaking, when something hits my body and it's the truth, I feel it in every cell in my body. And then I'm committed. If I don't feel it, then I'm like, "Mm, I'm not feeling this. So I'm not going to do it. You know, and, and, and being North North Node Scorpio, South Node Taurus, you know, I'm coming from that very black and white background. So I'm just like, it's easy for me to say yay or nay. You know, my job is learning now to be a bit more mutable uh, mm-hmm. between those two perspectives. But sometimes having that clarity of like, yes or no, do or don't do, eliminates all of that kind of mind energy. Well, well, well if I do this and that, da, 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 da. it's like, no, either I feel it or I don't. My teacher, yeah. Pam Montgomery, called it the ping fud method. When we're talking to plants and we want permission to make a medicine, do I get a ping? Yes, let's make a medicine. Or do I get a mm, fud? Like, no, I think the plant's saying no. Right. You know, and it's the same. We have to listen to to those feelings. So I'm totally with you. This is, we are um, beings that feel in multiple ways, energetically, physically, you know, emotionally, spiritually, all the rest of it. And so I really recommend that people embrace how to feel expand and even if it feels uncomfortable that's also part of the experience if we're just constantly chasing the bliss feeling then then we're avoiding something and we're at a time when whatever you've avoided man it's going to come and find you and it's going to rattle its stuff in your face and you'll wish you'd looked at it five ten years ago when it first presented itself yeah. and i think that that's the process we're in around and it's like we we are being given the most incredible opportunity to step into a new type of frequency but in order to do so, we have to let go of some of the baggage or in fact, all of the baggage. And that's okay. okay. It's okay. It's scary, but it's okay. Yeah, absolutely. I love this conversation. I could do at least another hour, hour of it. Yes, you. But I want to be mindful of the, the information, the vast information that you've shared and make sure it's digestible. Thank you so much for your time and energy and wisdom sharing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Naranjan. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. I've enjoyed the conversation and our previous conversations off camera too. And if anybody would like to, to reach out, then you can get me my email address, david at wisdomhub.tv, or you can even check out some of the stuff on Wisdom Hub Television. But uh, I love to talk about plants. And so I love to hear from people. I love to hear people's plant experiences because that's really where we feel. When we engage with nature, we feel, we really feel something. And the more that we open into that space, the more that we can feel our deep connection to the, the to the beautiful planet that we live on. So thank you again, Naranj, and thank you to all of your listeners. Muchas gracias. I'm Naranjan, and you've been listening to Master of Your Crafts podcast. Please subscribe, rate, and review, and join me next week for another episode. Thank you for listening.